Welcome everyone uh, to tonight's proceedings. Uh, my name is Rob Gell. I have the pleasure of being the President of the Royal Society of Victoria. Before we begin, in a spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that all of us are located on the traditional lands of this state's first scientists, many different First Nations peoples who belong to the diverse lands and waters of what we now call Victoria. We're coming to you, of course, tonight from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and I invite everyone joining us tonight either via Zoom's webinar chat function or YouTube's comment section for those following on the live stream to acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, of your own local country and join me in paying respects to Elders past, present uh, and likewise extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us in the meeting tonight. Uh, before I do begin and introduce our uh, special guest speaker, I'm delighted uh, that joining us, we have a new Vice President at the Royal Society of Victoria, Professor the Honourable Carolyn McMillan. As uh, you may, many of you will know Carolyn, uh, she, we've had some discussions and I've been able to persuade her to join the Council and she seems to be still most enthusiastic about doing that, uh, which is good. So you'll know, some of you will know her as formerly the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Newcastle and State Scientist in South Australia, amongst many, many other wonderful things. So we're looking forward to uh, to working with you, Carolyn. Welcome to the Society, if I think, probably for your first lecture here, is it? It is, and thank you. No problem. So tonight we're delighted. <laughs> So tonight we're delighted to be joined by Professor Patrick Dedecker AM for his presentation on Holocene Climatic Fluctuations in the Australian Region. Patrick is our 2023 Medalist for Excellence in Scientific Research in Category 3 Earth Sciences. So now our Medal for Excellence is our most prestigious award that the Society awards annually. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Patrick's research career uh, before I hand over to his nominator, who happens to be Professor Peter Gell, uh, to give us a more uh, informal overview. And Mike, I was going to ask you, is this the first time there have been two emeritus professors of paleoecology, sorry, that's a bit brief for you, Pat, in, this, in the Royal Society at the same time? Uh, I'm not sure. I think they're pretty deep on the ground, those paleoecologists, so it's, uh, it's very, yeah. very likely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor Patrick Dignetta, uh, AM and Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, is an emeritus professor based at the ANU College of Science. Patrick pioneered the study of quaternary history of the oceans bordering Australia, that's the last two million years, and has principally used microfossils and their chemical composition to reconstruct past changes. He was also first to link patterns of environmental change on land through Salt Lake records and at sea, again using <coughs> microfossils and other proxies. He, was, he has found that during the Holocene, the oceans have progressively warmed. Now, when was that, Patrick? Because I think that's probably common knowledge today, but that was some time ago. That's right. That's right, yeah. His most recent innovative research deals with the microbiological and geochemical fingerprinting of airborne dust with the aim at linking dust events with changes in the oceans. Patrick completed his PhD in the Department of Zoology at the University of Adelaide on salt lakes, their biota and quaternary lacustrine deposits, a field he continued during his postdoctoral uh, positions. He then obtained a DSC from the same university, this time from the Department of Geology and Geophysics, which is a nice switch as well, uh, for long-term accomplishment in the fields of limnology, paleolimnology, paleoceanography, and micropaleontology. And my brother informs me you could be otherwise described as a limnogeologist, which I don't think I would have heard that before, but it's a really nice, it's a really nice thing. In 1998, Patrick joined the Australian National University and held a full-time teaching position combined with research up until his recent retirement. Throughout his career, Patrick's work has been, has been multidisciplinary in nature with a common aim to obtain information of relevance for the reconstruction of past marine and continental environments of importance for the understanding of global and regional climate climatic variability. In recognition of his efforts and achievements, he's been awarded the Virco Medal in 1992, the Australian Society for Limnology Medal in 2005, the Christopher Plantel Medal in 2008, the Mawson Medal in 2010, and the Brady Medal in 2019. And tonight, a little later, the Royal Society of Victoria's 2023 Medal for Excellence in Scientific Research. In 2007, he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia for his research and teaching efforts and an officer of the Order of Leopold II by the Kingdom of Belgium. 
in 2018. My brother tells me that's about drinking Belgian beer and for outstanding achievements in science. So much for my uh, formal account. I'm now going to hand over to Peter uh, to give us a more visceral reading of Patrick's research advances. Peter. Okay, thank, thanks, uh, Robin. Congratulations, Patrick. And <clears throat> I first uh, met Patrick uh, when he came down to Monash from the ANU in the mid to late 80s, <clears throat> where he set about uh, tormenting ostracod crustaceans in beakers by denying them the solutes they needed to build their shell. Um, <clears throat> I thought that was uh, rather an unjust way of treating animals, but uh, <clears throat> of course that work um, <clears throat> went on to develop uh, the geochemical analysis that we use around the world today, which enables us to look at the geochemistry of those shells and independently reconstruct both temperature and salinity from the same sequence. Pioneering work back in the 90s with, with Alan Shivers. He also set upon tormenting the postgraduate students, and I remember very well uh, standing on the core in the northwest crater at Tower Hill, taking the sediment core, uh, and Patrick insisting that we twist the rods as hard as possible to make sure that the coring head closed, knowing full well that the previous year the rods had snapped and we spent a whole day trying to retrieve our, our equipment. So uh, we weren't very happy with Patrick um, uh, putting pressure on the coring equipment. But of course, again, uh, that work led to a 16 and a half metre um, sediment record, which is the longest handheld core from Victoria, I believe, only beaten by Peter Kershaw's uh, 17 metre core on the Atherton. And uh, the basal age was 20,000 years, and it set the age of Tower Hill back from what was thought to be 5,000 years back into the Ice Age, and enabled us to, uh, to have a closer look at the nature of Ice Age the glacial landscapes, vegetation, and lake condition um, through that time. Patrick was instrumental through his international contacts in enabling me to get a post at Université de Paris-Sud, where I spent uh, a couple of years and I remember Patrick coming visiting for a month and we would over a Belgian beer or two on a Friday afternoon chuckle at various uh, vaudevillian things that would happen within the laboratory in France, such as there being no toilet paper for a month in any of the toilets in the building. And <clears throat> of course, having only three phones on the floor, the secretary in the central office had to call out to any professor who had an incoming call and he would trot down the corridor to receive his phone call uh, publicly in the general, general office, which we found quite curious and, and very French, of course. Um, <clears throat> those contacts led to Patrick having the privilege of hosting the International Paleolimnology Congress in 93 in Canberra, which he did so with Robin Clark. And I had the privilege myself of sharing the pre-conference field trip with Patrick to the Western District of Victoria, uh, whereupon we travelled up the west side of Victoria and introduced these international uh, delegates to uh, Lake Mungo with uh, Jim Bowler explaining all that history that he discovered in the 60s. So it was a, a lakes tour and uh, the people that came because Patrick was leading the tour, including uh, world's leaders such as Ray Bradley, Sherry Fritz, Neil Roberts, uh, and um, Patrick's old mate Rick Forrester, of course, came along as well. Of course, um, Patrick has moved uh, away from lakes and diversified into the ocean drilling to dust work, uh, but he continues these extraordinary international links uh, through that emerging research, which I believe is still continuing from the, uh, the CV I've seen, I've seen. But of course, he continues to return uh, to the lakes of Western Victoria. And we'll hear more about that today when we get a Holocene reconstruction, which of course, I'll remind everybody, goes up to today because the Anthropocene uh, doesn't exist, as we heard a few weeks ago. Um, uh, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing Patrick give us an update on the Holocene in Australia. So congratulations, Patrick. Thanks, Pete. Um, I also have an email to share from Professor Jim Bowler.
uh, who couldn't be with us tonight, and, but he records his apologies and sends this message, Patrick, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. Jim says, Patrick Dedee has that remarkable legacy, top of the tree in unexcelled study of Australian lakes. For almost a decade, we worked together on those challenges at the ANU. I must converse to, confess to some anxiety when Patrick turned from relatively manageable small lake systems to the big one, ocean studies. I need not have worried. Patrick's recent work has revolutionised so much of our understanding of the marine sedimentary record with particular emphasis on climatic change and complex feedback systems. I retain a treasured copy, copy of a 1981 RSV tribute, a much less worthy occasion than that you confer on Patrick this evening. So it's really nice to hear from Jim on such an auspicious occasion as this evening. With that, let's make uh, Patrick welcome to provide his lecture, Holocene Climatic Fluctuations in the Australian Region. Welcome, Patrick. Well, thank you very much. Indeed, I feel very privileged to be in this uh, Augustus place. So I'd like to talk about the Holocene in the last 12,000 years of uh, uh, Australian history, and you will see uh, there have been many, many changes. You have here at the bottom, at the top, you've got uh, Blue Lake in the Snowy Mountains. I will talk about this lake and Lake Keelumbeet, which was actually first studied by Jim Bowler, and you can see uh, ancient shorelines indicating that a lake level has uh, changed. I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the first inhabitants of Australia who have lived through 50,000 years, that's about two and a half thousand generations, through climatic changes from a wet to a very dry Australia, and I, uh, I, I feel very privileged to be able to work and, uh, uh, and, and uh, describe more about uh, human activities in Australia. So my first experience started when I left Adelaide University and I went to the ANU to work with Jim Bowler, who had uh, envisioned a, an amazing five-year program to call large salt lakes. And uh, the reason being that uh, large salt lakes at some stage, like Lake Eyre today, at some stage, Lake Eyre was five times the size of uh, 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 what it is today. And uh, how was the climate uh, like? So we spent a lot of time uh, studying these lakes. And these are the machines that we used uh, on these uh, 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 salt crusts at Lake Air, Lake Buchanan. But also the bottom slide shows you uh, dust being deflated from the lake floors and they go in different direction. The colors indicate a different nature of the, the, the clays. And uh, ever since uh, knowing about this, I actually started looking at clays, airborne clays in the ocean and try to link environmental change in the ocean and what happened on land as well. So I'll just take an example of this very large uh, Lake Buchanan in central Queensland, very uh, saline on this plateau, and you can see some ancient shorelines uh, of this lake, indicating that at some stage uh, the lake uh, had a lot of water. However, the BM boundary, that's a Brunus Matiyama boundary, it's about 780,000 years ago, is at five meters. So five meters of sediment representing such a long period of time. So material must have been lost, material must have been deflated. And that's what led me to think that maybe I could find the answer uh, in, in the ocean. And you have here a crater lake, um, Notak, it's like a gigantic rain gauge. So the principle is this. You have a crater lake with a very well-defined catchment, and it rains in that catchment, and you also have some salt, sea salts, that uh, drift around. Lake Notak is only 50 kilometers from the sea. So the lake is very salty. Today, it's twice seawater salinity. So the principle that I used in seawater in red, the box in red is 35 grams of salt in seawater, and that's 35 
uh, uh, parts per third or 35 salinity. Lake Nortak today, twice that amount of salt. Uh, however, uh, if 100 years ago, Lake Joe, or uh, Lake uh, Nortak had more water, so he had still had 70 grams of salt, but the salinity was halved because of the dilution. And in the past, about three and a half thousand years ago, the salinity was 140 parts per thousand grams per liter. So I used those proxies to tell me about climate change. So there are principles uh, worth considering with respect to past climate. Australia is a disadvantage because, as I said, you have a loss of uh, record through uh, deflation of the weathering and soil formation. Uh, there are long records of environmental uh, in the ocean because it's more or less continuous. And, uh, and the marine records, these piles of sediments, just like the books, uh, the pages in a book like the archives, I can correlate with what happened in the ocean around Australia, but elsewhere in the world. And then I can find terrestrial pollen, clay, uh, deposit from rivers in the ocean, so I can see and say what happened between the land in the ocean, and I can determine if there are lags and leads between the two. A characteristic of Australia is that the southern hemisphere is a maritime hemisphere compared to the northern hemisphere. It's bordered by three major oceans, and the Australian climate is dictated mostly by the ocean, what's happening in the ocean. And you have the Indo-Pacific warm pool north of Australia that borders around uh, Indonesian, Indonesia and other islands. And then there are two currents that are offshoots of this warm pool that circumnavigate Australia. You'll see a map in a minute. So I take, my principle has been to take a sample, the little box uh, in white, and then I can extract a lot of things. In blue is the terrestrial archives, the pollen, the quartz from the wind, total organic carbon, barium and titanium, again, produced by a transfer of dust in the clays. And then in, in mauve or pink, you have uh, all the other proxies that I can obtain from the core. All that from one sample. I take one little centimeter and I can uh, decant the pollen and, and so on. So uh, it's been a time consuming, but I was able to say much more about what was happening in the ocean. And have a look at this map of Australia. And we actually went to look for many cores. And, uh, it's been a very difficult exercise at times. Uh, to go at sea for one day is $50,000, and you have to be with a large group of people. So today I will talk about three cores, and these are the red rectangles, one in northwest uh, near Exmouth in uh, Western Australia, and then two in Victoria and South Australia. Oops. So you have to remember that uh, sea levels, 20,000 years ago, sea levels were about 125 meters below that today. You could walk to Tasmania, you could walk to uh, New Guinea. And you have a look at the periphery of Australia. Uh, you see where Darwin is and so on. And we, and this warm pool, <coughs> where there were a lot of people living there, uh, was very, very different. And then sea level rose sometime at, uh, of the order of one meter every 90 years. This is a lesson to take because we are witnessing a sea level change. I will talk about this lake there, uh, this core. And uh, you just, uh, the gray uh, uh, curve here, indicate sea level change. And then we have a proxy to reconstruct sea surface temperature. 
And you have to look at the axis in thirds of years, going back to 30 thirds. So around 12,000 years ago, the temperature was much warmer than today. And you can see after that, it declined. And then we have another proxy to look at the amount of rainfall. I'm not going to explain how we obtained that. But uh, the summary is that at about 12,000, the monsoonal system started to appear in northern Australia. And ENSO started about 5,000 years ago. ENSO is the alternation between La Nina and El Nino. So these are the sort of uh, information that we can obtain. And then there's a summary slide because I'm going to talk about the Holocene. The Holocene is defined as the last 11,700 years before present. Sometimes uh, they say CE for common era. And, uh, and so you can see here uh, data for many sites around the world. And there's a, uh, a period when the climate was at it, an optimum. It was very uh, warm and wet. And then uh, for the last 10,000 years, in red shows periods in Europe which were warmer and others that were um, uh, colder and drier. And you have the little ice age uh, that some of us interested in wines know that uh, you no longer could have grapes in the UK and they switched to brewery. Now they're going back to uh, grapes. And then the, the Holocene is divided in Europe in the North Hemisphere at several different periods. Have we got the same in Australia? That's the question. So there are some magnificent, outstanding changes during that period from 12,000 years ago. Population in the, on the globe increased at an exponential uh, rate towards the end. And today, we're even high. And the grazing and the crops of land are changed as well. And as a result, you have a huge amount of sediment transported by rivers, but that end up in uh, the ocean. So a lot of significant changes. Were they um, related to or affected by climate? So there's another summary slide uh, showing the Pleistocene, the period before uh, 11,700. It was so dry and cold that a lot of vegetation animals were in the lowlands. And then at about 11,700, things went up, uh, uh, the, the, up, the, up the hill. And, uh, and this is for Asia, but uh, we'll see what happened in Australia during that time. So this uh, important slide is shows North Africa for various periods. Before 8,500 and so on, you can look at the yellow boxes. Before 8,500, it was very dry. And the red dots indicate human settlement or human activities or uh, implements and stone tools and so on. And when it became very wet, look where people went. A complete change. And then a bit later, it was still wet and people were... Uh, away from the River Nile and uh, similar uh, rivers became dry, they moved back towards the river. So what was it like in Australia? So here's a, I think it's a magnificent three-dimensional view of Eastern Australia. And you've got, uh, the elevation is exaggerated, but you've got uh, on, on this uh, figure, those sites that I'm gonna talk about, and you can see the East Australian current that extends today is even further down to Tasmania. And the Luan current that circumnavigates Western Australia and can reach Adelaide uh, and even uh, Victoria. So this is shown uh, on, on this map here. I'll talk a little bit about a Salem Macquarie and also an ice core in uh, Antarctica. So here are some photographs of uh, Blue Lake in uh, the Snowy Mountains, some lakes in Tasmania 
on Fraser Island, a cave in Tasmania. They looked at uh, this, what I call speleothems. Some of you call them stalactite or stalagmite. Some salt lakes in Western Victoria and a lake in, uh, on Macquarie Island. So the first lake uh, is, uh, uh, there are two crater lakes in Western Victoria. I spend a lot of time uh, there. Nortuck, as I said today, is uh, very saline. And uh, we consider them as gigantic rain gauge and I gave you the reasoning behind that. So I'm now going to go look at lakes from the north, from uh, Lake Mackenzie in uh, Fraser Island. And uh, people have reconstructed air temperature above the lake from the chemical, organic chemical composition of, uh, of the sediment. And uh, there's uh, highlighted in red a period of time between about 8,000 and 5,500 a period when the temperatures were high. In the uh, uh, snowy mountains, Blue Lake, and uh, people have looked at pollen in uh, Blue Lake, and they found pollen of Pomoderis, a plant that does not exist around Blue Lake today. And also, we looked at uh, little grains of quartz that we found in, in the lake. And so, uh, just go for Pomoderis. Pomoderis was abundant between 8,000 and 5,000 years ago. So that's that red bar again. And then there was very little quartz grain indicating reduced winds. And if time allows, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pygmy possum, this little possum that I can hold in my hand, that lives today at the snow line. And people are worried that it will disappear with climate improving. But I will argue that 5,000 years ago, when there was the snow line was above the lake, a pygmy possum must have lived. The big difference between what happened in the past and today is today the environmental change is extremely fast. The animal genetically hasn't got perhaps the time to recover. More about that later. So I had to mention Lake George, uh, very well uh, studied. And today is full of water. And, uh, and again, looking at from zero to 12,000 years ago, there are three phases when Lake George had very high levels. Again, the red bars indicate very similar to those events that I discussed uh, before. There was a, a phase about in 1880 when the lake had close to eight meters of water and you had steamboats on the, on the lake. But more, more about this later. So paleolimnology, the word that was uh, mentioned uh, before, is looking at archives in those lakes. And here we had a coring device with compress there coming out like a rocket out of the water. It's pretty exciting. The adrenaline is pretty good. But we got four meters of sediment. And these four meters are just like pages in a book. And one centimeter represents two and a half years of deposition. So we can actually look almost at on a yearly basis, what happened in this lake. And uh, so these two crater lakes with uh, uh, ancient trees that are now coming out uh, of the lake. But you can see again this period of time, uh, the red bar, when the lake, both lake levels uh, uh, were very high. And in Tasmania, uh, two lakes, the vegetation, this is the percentage of rainforest taxa, well, the red bar, and you can see the high uh, rainforest taxa. And the same was found for other lakes near uh, <coughs> the Cradle uh, Mountain uh, National Park. And the palynologists have said after 9,000 years ago, fire activity declined 
and rainforest increasing substantially. Today it's, it's different. This cave in Tasmania, again, people looked at the chemistry of these uh, uh, stalagmite, uh, speleothems, and the conclusion is the warmest climate occurred between 8,000 and 7,400, followed by the wettest period. But again, the same uh, window that I mentioned before. And then you go to Antarctica, and here's a photograph on a nice core with a, a Nash layer, and here's a photograph of a similar ice core, and you can see the little bubbles uh, in the ice core with the light behind. And people have been able to ex extrude the gases in those bubbles and measure CO2 and, and methane and so on. And during that period, that red bar that I mentioned, in Antarctica, the CO2 levels were lower, and the temperature was also lower. So something very different from what happened uh, on the Australian continent. Let's go at sea. The best French restaurant on the ocean. And I'll tell you, you should see the, fr the fromage, I would say, the cheese room. They have cheese for one year on this ship, and it's worth spending a few minutes there. And uh, they also can take very, very long course. And you can see here a 30, more than f close to 40 meter pipe, and the gray uh, mud on the outside shows that the core has penetrated 32 meters of sediment. And again, the sedimentation rate is that one centimeter is about two, two years. Okay, we, so we've got these archives we can compare, and it's a lot of work. And uh, we got the course in uh, many years ago, and, and uh, it, it took several uh, years to, to extract the information. Sometimes we are unlucky at sea, and there's a, we send another core, and we hit rock, and we end up with a bent core and we spend, we waste a lot of time. But c'est la vie, as they say. And uh, so here's a photograph of two students on the ship uh, co uh, logging the core. And you can see, maybe you can see on the right hand side, change of color and, and so on. And uh, so we have taken sample every two centimeters for uh, several meters. Or, 15 meters or so, so it's a lot of work. So these two cores are their location, uh, one near Kangaroo Island and the other one offshore the Otways. And uh, you can see uh, they are under the influence at times of the Lewin current. The red color shows you a warm uh, current, but at time it didn't function. So offshore Kangaroo Island, again in yellow, a sea surface temperature we were able to reconstruct from the uh, composition of organisms that are found uh, in uh, the core. And uh, we also looked at little creatures that live in the ocean. There's some sketches there. And their abundance relates to the stratification of uh, the ocean. And we can tell when they were growing in the La Nina period or El Nino up here. So uh, that's what we were able to, to do. Uh, offshore Victoria, 600 kilometers away from that core, same pattern. Again, look at the uh, red bars. Uh, and also, we have spent, it's w worth working with Germans because they have a lot of money and they pay for 27 radiocarbon dates at $500 a date. Okay, they're my best friends. <laughs> In summary, so the lake records, again, that period that I mentioned before, uh, a lake <coughs> with it, uh, air temperature, uh, very little wind activity, pomaderis, that plant that doesn't grow there today, and what's happening in, with the vegetation and what's happening in Antarctica. For the uh, marine records, the two cores, 
the one from Nikangural, sea surface temperature. By the way, pay attention that from about 5,000 years ago, temperature progressively dropped by 2 degrees. Today, we're going back up. But the trend is there, like the core that I showed you from northern Australia before. And again, uh, a La Nina uh, period there. And then we looked at glaciers in uh, uh, New Zealand because they're also affected by uh, ocean temperature. And in blue at the very bottom, the curve for the two crater lakes in Victoria. So here's some images of uh, uh, Lake Tekapo area uh, in, and, uh, in uh, New Zealand, and they dated the moraines. They even spent more money uh, to date uh, uh, the moraines. But there's an absence of moraines between 5,000 and 8,000, except for three moraines that were active uh, around uh, in the middle of it. And now you look at these other moraines again, and you can see there's a sea surface temperature uh, change in, in Australia. So uh, the, the Americans who are working in New Zealand are very impressed with uh, the coincidence between our records and theirs. So uh, going back to human presence in Australia, here are the black dots that are very important to realize. These are for human presence uh, for the Holocene. People were everywhere, okay? And uh, uh, Alan Williams and his colleague have said that there is a resource abundance in early to mid Holocene when, uh, when there was a lot of water and a longer patch residence time and a, a development of low level production. But we go back to other places and those of you who know a bit about uh, Menindee and Lake Menindee and the Darling, you can see that uh, these lakes were filled with water and uh, the black dots show people were inhabiting in the vicinity of these lakes. However, between that town and six town, people moved to the east. Today, this is a satellite image that shows you this area is extremely dry. People were living there because the climate was very different. Okay? And that's uh, important to recognize. And then they moved back to the original site, a bit like what happened in uh, Africa that I mentioned before. So I just, uh, I'm not an archaeologist, and I just read the literature by Peter Coots and, and others who looked at archaeological surveys in Victoria, and they actually found these mounds uh, in the vicinity of uh, the River Murray. And here's a photograph taken in 1918 and, uh, with a mound. And I'm going to be very careful here because skeletons have been found in some of these mounds. People were living there, and uh, I decided not to show this a photo of the skeleton, but a, a, a drawing uh, that was produced at the time. Now, what I discovered also, another survey, you've got Lake Borlac near Mount Hamilton. The black dots identify mounds everywhere, and I must admit, I have crisscrossed this countryside. I'd never seen them. I was unaware of their existence, and I I'd like to, to go back and, and have a look. But people were living in agglomeration very close to rivers. Let's go to other places in Australia where you have earth mounds discovered in northern Australia, in South Australia, in Victoria, and New South Wales. And uh, here is a detailed uh, archaeological work down with uh, uh, some large uh, uh, photographs showing occupation around rivers, and the archaeologists say people were living in large groupings, villages, and hamlets around water bodies that suggest our ecological hotspot. But when 
after 4,000 years ago. After that wet period, a, a warm period. Another site in South Australia, again some mounds, and uh, the eldest mound date dates to 4,800, 4,200. After this very wet period, when Enso, the alternative, alternative between La Nina and El Nino occurred, uh, they started to settle down, and not before. And uh, again, another uh, uh, flat plane with new radiocarbon dates published only a year ago, uh, showing a broadening of the darts in, this, uh, in response to environmental challenges and a sort of demographic social factors. So a very big change. And now I read a paper that was published last week uh, by Michael Bird and others from James Cook University that fire activities in northern Australia near Darwin uh, changed completely around four or five thousand years ago. So climate really affected human population. So the summary of my presentation during the Holocene it is a period of time that uh, stands out as was wetter and warmer. The ocean currents were very different. The uh, East Australian current, I'm not too sure, but the Lowland current south of Australia was uh, extremely strong and very warm and bringing tropical faunas uh, or where you don't find them today. And uh, the westerlies, this is very important winds that bring the rain, were further south, okay? So uh, the climate was much, much uh, more kind. So it was the equivalent of a continuous La Nina phase. And it lasted, the dates are here, you can read them. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, have to thank many people, Peter Kershaw and and many others. But I have to, especially in the middle of the slide here, mention all my colleagues and students who this work wouldn't have been presented here without uh, uh, their, their help and their interest and their enthusiasm. And we definitely had an international laboratory. And uh, my first PhD student is sitting here in the front who uh, actually had been at sea before me. So these students taught me how to take course and, and do things like that. So I benefited very much from that uh, younger generation. And then the Australian Council uh, provided me with a few dollars and the uh, French Polar Institute with its French restaurant, uh, which I will never forget. <laughs> and uh, being a chief scientist, I was at the table of the captain and I had a bottle of wine at lunchtime and at dinner time. But during the three and a half days near Kangaroo Island, I didn't sleep. The adrenaline was strong and we just worked day, day and night. So uh, I think I thank you for your uh, attention. And I, if time allows, I can talk about a pygmy possum, but- Yes, we can. Yeah, but- uh, Please thank Patrick for his wonderful <laughs> So what do we need to know about pygmy possums? Well, I'm very optimistic because uh, uh, I, I knew they, they are threatened. They were threatened recently by the major bushfires, and there's been a, uh, an interest in actually bringing them f from food down the, uh, the rock screes and so on. But I have a, a, an optimism that uh, they will survive uh, the change in that area although there's more roads and there's more uh, habitation and so on. But uh, I think, uh, and I think the vegetation will change too. And I think Pomoderis, that plant that I mentioned, will come back uh, 
uh, uh, up there. Well, there are some people. In, there are some people in the audience might have some questions on exactly that about food source for possums and all sorts of things. Anyway, I think I won't ask. There's many people here, and I know there's about perhaps 30 online, and there'll be lots of questions. So, can we begin? Uh, I was fascinated. I've learned a lot, and I had really enjoyed your presentation. It was terrific. Thank you. So, what about some former students? What have you learned? What, what have you learned again tonight? No pressure, but. No uh, back to Western Victoria, Patrick, and of course, um, eucalyptus almost completely replaced casuarina at around about 7,000 years ago. Yeah. So nearly, you know, from Geelong to the border it was all casuarina, then by seven, six and a half thousand years ago it was all eucalyptus. Yeah. How does that fit in with this hypsothermal? Yeah, eight, there, eight to five. There's an issue about the vegetation in Western Victoria because there's the uniqueness of the soil, okay? Whereas we now know, I looked also at the vegetation uh, before the Holocene. During the glacial period, when sea levels were 125 meters below that today, Casuarina, no, Calatrus, Calatrus, the native part, was everywhere. So when you drive through the hay plains and there's all little pockets of collateral in uh, Canberra, I think they're a relict forest from those glacial times when the climate was extremely dry and much colder. Temperature was eight degrees below that of today. But there were people around. So uh, a very important. How's everybody dealing with the time thing tonight? It's really cool, isn't it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> feel obliged to ask a question then. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your mentorship, Patrick, and it was really nice to be your student, the first student, a long time ago. Um, yeah, I wanted to know, have your opinion about the fact that uh, El Nino started five and a half thousand years ago. What triggered it, in your opinion? <laughs> I don't know. And uh, the people in New Zealand, the Americans who start looking at the moraines when there were the major changes, they don't know. They know that it links with the westerlies. The westerlies are very, very important in our region. And you know when the westerlies are very strong in winter, uh, the climate in Victoria is not that comfortable. And uh, but at times the westerly uh, uh, move further south, and uh, it's very rapid, very rapid. Yeah. And what's happening today? Because we know that the 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 uh, anticyclones are now moving further south with climate change as well, and that's presumably having a similar impact. That's right. Yes, and uh, um, I am very curious. Uh, I've looked also in some of our work at uh, the core that we've got of shore kangaroos opposite the mouth of the River Murray. So in that core, there's all the clays that come from the River Murray. And we actually have uh, been, been able to identify that uh, Southern Australia has different clays than uh, around the Darling because of the ge geological formations are different. So for the first time we were able to say when the Murray was flooding water from, from the Darling and not from the south. And, uh, so it, it's, and the vegetation was different too. So, and the, we know also that the rain in the Darling area and its catchment comes from the north, not from the south. So, they are, they are, we need to know more about it. And I regret in many ways that uh, a lot of ecologists and meteorologists only look at the last 100 years. And uh, going back to the Holocene, we can actually identify significant changes and people ought to under, appreciate that. Okay, so I, I can't see any questions, so I'm going to ask another one. Is there, have you got some online? Okay, let me ask one. So, the, the Prime Minister, I know, gave a billion dollars to a new solar, uh, Australian yeah. solar panel manufacturer to locate in the Hunter Valley. If you had a billion dollars 
And uh, perhaps uh, the Germans haven't got quite as good food as the French, have they? <laughs> but if we had lots of Germans who wanted to spend on things to do, what would you? What do we need to do? What would? What would be the one thing? What would be the next voyage or the next trip or the next yeah. twelve months no, that you'd like to see done? I would like to invest in the young generation, get the kids and school more interested in this exciting science, and uh, and to also realise there's a future for them. Uh, uh, doing doing science and there's a lot of things that uh, we need to explore further and we need these new brains. Mine is uh, aging somehow, but uh, I, I would like to invest uh, in in human resources. So what's the yeah. quick? Well, okay, so what? So, so we have a new group at the Royal Society called the Emerging Scientists Network. They're undergrads, uh, scientists, lots from Monash. What's the question you want them to answer? Uh, I would like them to inv invest in multidisciplinary science. I think if you just do one thing, and I, I, uh, I have you heard that I'm interested in many different things, but it's by combining this information. Uh, so multidisciplinary science, read a lot and uh, travel a lot and go abroad a lot uh, because... Science is international. See if you can get yourself a spot on the French. <laughs> Catriona. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I'm passing along questions from online. We've got lots of people listening in online. Um, but please do stay yeah. by the microphone because otherwise they won't hear up. your answers. You can speak a bit louder. <laughs> yeah. Speak up louder, yep. um, So there, there was a mention on, on one of your slides um, of around anthropogenic change in relation to river sediments. So someone was just asking if you could expand, please, on um, anthropogenic changes that were causing the river sediments to change too. I'm not sure if I heard the question. It was about anthrop anthropogenic changes yeah. with river sediments. Yeah. Yeah. But <clears throat> I would like to say that uh, people have been in Australia for 50 plus thousand years. They have changed the vegetation. They have changed uh, the climate indirectly. People are now very much aware that if you burn the vegetation, uh, the, the, the runoff is, is, is very different. And uh, it's, uh, so practices uh, have been for a long time. We know <coughs> uh, from a call near Lake, at Lake George in, in in Canberra, that uh, people have looked at charcoal in the core going back 600,000 years. And there's, there's statistically a, a bit of charcoal now and again. And then there's a period of time when there's a huge amount of, an increase of charcoal. People say that's humans. I'm not gonna discuss the date because that's controversial, but it's human. And what happened? the spec vegetation spectra changed. There were more fire-tolerant uh, plants, the eucalyptus and so on, and many others intolerant disappeared. So humans, for a long time, have affected the Australian continent. We need to acknowledge that, and we also need to know that in the last 200 years, and at Lake George again, charcoal increased more because there's more burning, but the vegetation has changed. Yeah. Duke Veltus is one of our Royal Society councillors. Yeah. Uh, Professor Decker, thank you so much. Uh, this really uh, brought back so many good memories as well of uh, I was traipsing across different landscape myself. And one of the things that you picked up on just now was the need for interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. And one of the things that I loved about your presentation is it shows decades and decades of literally having your feet on the ground or, or on, the, on, the, on the sea boat. And I'm curious to um, ask you, could you expand on how does your brain work with the data in, in, in at, the, at the very local scale? You've done almost a hyper-local and somehow you've managed to combine everything from, from, from the hyper-local lake to all the way through to the oceans. Uh, and somehow with that, you're also in, in, in investing in terms of thinking about the human side of it. 
And one of the things, the reason I'm asking this question, a lot of um, my students now are looking at models and theoretical models, and it all seems really overwhelming where you even start to think about putting that data together. Would you mind talking us through a little bit that process that you go through to connect all these brilliant uh, stories? Well, my first answer, I sleep very little. <laughs> and uh, so I have time to gather that I'll that data, but I'm, I'm very interested in the natural environment, and uh, I've been able to, I gathered a lot of information that perhaps proved uh, uh, unhelpful, and but then some spectra of the vegetation and some clays in the rivers have given me some signals, and the more, as and also I've worked with many people, and it's their thesis and their dissertation and the articles and so on. And we've been able to, to match that there were some significant changes. And uh, that's very important. So the young people, I would like to encourage, do some uh, chemistry, physics, math, and statistics, and geology and biology. Uh, all these will bring you a, a better comprehension of our environment. Does that answer your question? Do it all, yeah. Is well. there a question from, here we are, yeah. yeah. Looking at the uh, charts you produce, there's some major variability um, over a fairly short time scale of, of, you know, 100 years to three or 400 years. Do you have explanations for what generates this uh, large variability and what causes it to change from one direction to another direction? Now, some some people are looking at uh, some people are looking at the position of the Earth with respect to the sun and this solar insulation and so on. There's some big trends there, but there are still some other minor changes, rapid changes, we still don't know. And I think these are our challenges. I'm a bit scared of, of modelers because uh, they need to look at my data and see how they, it fits with their models. Sometimes uh, they don't pay attention to that. And so that's why I'm so pleased to be able to publicize this a bit more. And hopefully this may go on YouTube and uh, we'll, we'll just see. But uh, there are still some, like, uh, 18,000 years ago, I mentioned this sea level uh, change, and we know that sea levels start rising when the glaciers in the northern hemisphere started melting. And we know that solar insulation and so on. But within less than a thousand years, glaciers in New Zealand just stopped working. They just retreated. And in Australia, uh, many of our lakes start filling up. And we, we are still scratching the surface, unfortunately. But it's better at this stage to document those changes with good chronology. There are many papers about vegetation changes in Tasmania, but in, these were in the days when people could not afford these radiocarbon dates. So there's some amazing data sets from Tasmania with one or two dates. We can't work with that anymore today. Uh, people require a lot of uh, uh, dates. And uh, the two crater lakes in Western Victoria, we now have a huge amount of dates. But when I did my PhD, my supervisor paid for two radiocarbon dates. That's all he could afford. Now people can get 400. And uh, it makes a big difference of understanding uh, the changes. Yes. I have a philosophical question. Um, so is your study, does your study of all these changes that have happened in the climate and how humans and plants and animals have adapted, does that give you hope for the future um, with the changes that we are facing due to industrialization to yeah. make that a short thing? Um, or do you feel as though this change that we're facing is different and will be more devastating. Uh, I won't comment about devastation, but what I'm saying is that my data or our data 
is so important for the managers of the landscape. They can see what the changes occur as a result of fire or uh, the extraction of groundwater and so on. There were natural events when the groundwater uh, disappeared or, or decreased. So um, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I think that uh, we need to feed managers, politicians, about um, some of these changes. They are dramatic, and some of them are irreversible, like the CO2 increase in the atmosphere. If we stop producing CO2 tomorrow, around the globe, it won't just start to diminish. It's just going to stay there for a long time. So uh, we need to do more science. We need to be uh, more informative. And also, I discovered that um, we ran this excursion, Western Victoria, with all these people. We did not talk to the local farmers, to the local council. And they were not aware of all the good science that we were doing. So I spent time uh, uh, giving talks to the Camperdown uh, uh, shy. And I must admit, one day I offered to give a talk at 4 o'clock. Oh, no, that's when we're milking the cows. So we had to postpone that a bit later. No, that's when we're feeding the kids. And uh, But anyway, I passed the message on. And... Uh, uh, but people need to appreciate this landscape. Western Victoria, with all these crater lakes, uh, tourists do the Great Ocean Road back and forth, okay? They could do the Great Ocean Road, go through Victoria, and look at all the lakes, like in the Lake District, it's very popular. The Eiffel in Germany, there's all these crater lakes. There's so much information they can, can learn about human um, and also exploration and also some of the sad things that happened with uh, the early settlers. Got a question? Oh. Uh, yes, there is. Yeah, follow up. <coughs> a follow up. From the geological record over the last 12,000 years and looking at the last 300 years, what, what are the trends from a geological or limnological perspective that you see? <laughs> you know, as, as a bit of a forecast of what might happen in the next hundred years, leaving uh, out the anthropogenic... Uh, I, I haven't got a crystal ball, but <laughs> I actually am very scared of the uh, climate change and climate uh, because uh, at some stage, in some places, it's going to become quite catastrophic. Uh, we need to, to be better way of the environment and look at periods of time when there were major climate shifts and better understand them and, uh, and especially the currents offshore. Uh, the ocean tropical waves that uh, affect the kelp in Tasmania and so on, they are ways to find out if that has happened in the past and uh, so uh, we need to invest into those studies. Yes, Rob Day. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Really interesting um, seminar, and, and I'm I'm amazed that you can actually uh, look at the um, places and numbers of places that humans were actually active around these different times and relate them to your story. But is it possible to see how climate, how the changes that you've documented uh, between the wetter period and the dry periods that followed, drier periods that followed, did those, is there any information about how many people were actually living um, in that general area do we see a decline in, in population as a result of these changes? I, I think we can't, we don't have enough information to address that. But you saw that map of Australia with a black dot showing human occupation during the Holocene. People were everywhere. And I also showed, when I showed the slides of 
the two crater lakes, uh, there were two uh, images at the end showing uh, trees. Maybe I can. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you? Uh, Not me. Uh, uh, okay. And, uh, hang on. And there they we go. Go back for, uh, yeah, quite some distance away, further. Chuk, chuk, chuk. Bit more, bit more. Oh. Uh, I think, yeah, keep, yeah, yeah this slide. The, these are trees that some of them are still standing up there on, on the edge of the, those two uh, crater lakes. And they were growing 2,000 years ago, indicating the lake level was low. And then there was a rapid lake level rise that buried these lakes. Normally, if you have a slow rise, the waves of the lake will actually remove the, the soil around the roots and the trees collapse. No, it was really rapid. That was at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. There was a sudden increase of, of, of uh, 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 wetness in, in that part, in two lakes uh, apart. And uh, now, sadly, Jim Boller, when he was... Uh, the deputy director of the uh, uh, museum here, he wanted one of those trees to be actually placed into the museum because we can actually now look at the tree rings in these trees and tell me more about what the climate was like at the time. But uh, nobody got interested and the farmers thought, oh, there's some dead trees. They burned them. And it's beautiful wood, but uh, and they were... Uh, uh, many different species, but there is a, a an amazing event where uh, it it just got extremely wet for a long period of time, and then it came down. And in 1847, the lakes near Camperdown were overflowing into one another, and they've been going down ever since. And I think that's a, a result of the industrial revolution. Uh, in the long term, since 1847. So these ancient archives are very poor. Wow. Katiana has another question, I believe. Yep. Oh, hold it really close. <laughs> um, you were starting to touch on, on those sort of effects that we've started to see post industrial revolution and someone is wondering how much resolution you can detect at the surface part of the cause so in the past five to ten years is that still sort of holding up as each centimeter is about two yeah. years and we can get that detail so i mentioned that uh, you saw my, my map of australia with all these black dots um outside and i studied many cores but then i found a few cores that had high resolution, like the one offshore Victoria, the one offshore Kangaroo, where half a centimeter represents one year. Okay, so uh, it's a lot of work and very expensive too, but we haven't gone it year by year. But I took samples for the last 150,000 years every two centimeters. So uh, we've got a very high resolution, but people can do it a much higher resolution again, but uh, that's a new generation. So, so with that, have you learned a lot about the last, like the most recent years, like five, yeah. 10 years ago? There are some, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Issues at sea, the, the sediment uh, seafloor is like yogurt, really soft. And so when we go with these big corals, the cora has an eight ton weight, eight Volkswagen on the top of this, and it basically pushes that yogurt away. So we have other cores where we were able to uh, uh, identify the last few years. And we use a uh, radioactive isotope. The result of the atomic bonds can tell us where we are. I, I had an idea of looking at DDT 
in some of those courses because we know DDT was in the landscape 50 years ago, or maybe 60 now, and this is insoluble. And so there are other ways, and also the introduction of pine pollen in Australia. Pine didn't exist 150 years ago. So uh, we are able to, to, to look at that and... Uh, uh, and we looked at some of the isotopes. So we've seen some changes, uh, but again, uh, it involves, you can only get 60 centimeter long cores, but that's a lot of information. Some of them represent a thousand years, but people go for corals and uh, tree rings because uh, it's much more easily accessible. And there's a lot of information that address some of your question. In, in, in corals. And the example I use with corals, when people started to clear the land in Queensland, there was a huge discharge of clays at sea, and the clays carried a lot of metals like barium and others, and you find them in the corals. So uh, we can tell the changes that occur. And tree rings are not that easy in Australia because many of the trees don't have that sort of aptitude, but there's much that can be done. I'm going to give Patrick a break now. Uh, he's done a remarkable job. And I, I, I think he has, in fact, mapped out at least another 10 or 20 years of science that needs to be done. Uh, clearly, it's, clearly, it's there. Um, you've given us a most comprehensive, it is a wonderful intersectoral cross time uh, through a range of sciences uh, to understand uh, some things that are difficult for a lot of people to understand, but I think you've actually enthused us that and, and and told us that there is already a lot of information that could be drawn on, that we all need to take more interest when we go travelling across uh, the landscape, either in Victoria or elsewhere in the country, uh, but we do need to know a whole lot more, and it's there to be learned about. Um, would you please thank Patrick for his wonderful lecture? Um, I now have the great pleasure of moving to the more formal component of this evening's proceedings, which is the awarding of the Royal Society of Victoria's Medal for Excellence in Scientific Research. The medal has been awarded by the Royal Society of Victoria since 1959, when the Australian research sector was still quite young and growing in strength. And our first medalist was also an earth scientist, a geologist from the University of Melbourne by the name of Dr George Baker. Uh, whom I'm sure would be pleased to know that the tradition continues 65 years later. As President of the Royal Society of Victoria, it's my great pleasure to honour Professor Patrick De Decker, AMFAA, with the 2023 Medal for Excellence in Scientific Research in recognition of an outstanding career contribution to our understanding of the interactions between the changes to the Earth's systems through significant discoveries in the fields of limnology, paleolimnology, paleoceanography, and micropaleontology. And I present you now, Patrick, with your medal. Oh, thank you. And my surname is spelled properly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're good at that here. We're <laughs> yeah. good at that here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm very yeah. chuffed. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, and I will. I hope that my uh, message in, in the video will actually stimulate uh, a lot of young people uh, to be ambitious, just like Jim Baller was ambitious with his Salt Lake program. and. Uh, at first, he said he was a bit reluctant to see me going at sea, but uh, I think I've done quite a few uh, things that I'm very proud of. And and, but and, it and, was, and he is too. And through the the help of many students and and postdoctoral fellows and so on. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure.